The New Testament scripture reading is from John 9, verses 1 through 41, and you can find it on page 97 and 98 in your New Testament pew Bibles. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me, while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world... I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it's someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought the Pharisees to the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is now that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have already told you, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? 
Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. Amen. The word of God for which we give thanks. Will you pray with me, please? God, we ask for your blessing now as we consider this story from the Gospel of John. May it help us to see the world faithfully. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations upon each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So to start today's sermon, I've got a, a picture that quite frankly is a little painful to show you this morning. This is what we looked like when we came to this church in January of 2003. You'll notice a few things uh, different about me. One of them is I had brown hair. Uh, I had a brown beard. I had more hair. And the second thing is you notice I didn't have these. I didn't have glasses when I got here. It took a few years, probably about four or five before I started needing glasses. And uh, these are pretty strong ones too, by the way. These are trifocals. So I look in the three different sections to see you in various ways. And I remember a number of years ago when I first applied for a driver's license through the mail. And I, we had come here, and um, I think it was the first time I'd had prescription, and I tried to read the, the eye chart at the DMV office. And so um, that didn't go so well. And uh, when I received my driver's license um, in the mail the first time, you'll notice that there's this words, uh, these words restrictive corrective lenses. And I just recently reapplied for my license in the mail and got it once again, and it still has that saying, restrictive corrective lenses. In order for me to drive in the state of California, I have to keep these puppies on. And so my vision is now restricted. Kind of a strange thing to have on my driver's license, but there it is. So today's passage, read very well, thank you, Isabel, uh, is about a few things. First, of course, it's about healing. It's about the fact that Jesus healed a blind man. But it's about more than that. It has to do with uh, something I call spiritual blindness, which also is a form of restricted vision. Spiritual blindness basically is you see the world in one of two ways. 
Either when you go out those doors, you look at the world and you see how God is working in it. You see where God is bringing change and hope and help and healing in your life and, and throughout the world. Or, or you go out and you say, well, you know, the world is just falling apart. There's nothing good about this world. And God is, is either non-existent or not interested in helping right now. There's really two ways that you can see this world. And so the question you need to ask yourselves at the end of the sermon today is, what's your vision like? Is it restricted? Or do you see through the eyes of faith? In fact, you can think of yourselves having, if you will, a Christian faith license. What does it say on that Christian faith license about how you see and how you see this world? The blind man in today's story goes through quite a progression. First, he calls Jesus a man and says, well, this man healed me, and I can see. But by the end of the passage, he proclaims him to be Messiah, and he worships him. So there's a progression of faith for this man. And not only is he able to see with his eyes, but he's able to see through his faith the world in a very different way. Now, today's passage comes right after a rather difficult time for Jesus in the temple. If you remember, a few weeks ago, I preached about how you can never go home again, and Jesus went back to Nazareth, and he almost got thrown off of a cliff overlooking Nazareth. Well, in today's passage, in, in chapter 8 of Luke, Jesus has gone into the temple and challenged the scribes and Pharisees a bit. And as a result, they've all gathered stones, and they're about to throw stones at him when he walks out of the temple, and he sees a blind man in front of the temple. And that's where today's story picks up. And as he comes with the disciples past this blind man, the disciples say, excuse me, Jesus, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind, that he was born in this way? You see, many believed that sin caused physical deformity and calamity upon a family. And that one could trace the problem back as far as the fourth generation, according to Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. Yet while the father's sins extend to the third and fourth generations, to those who are opposed to God, God's steadfast love is shown to the thousandth generation of those who love God. The second part of this passage was de-emphasized at the time, while the first part was relished as a way to judge and feel superior to others. So, if your great-great-grandparents sinned in some way, you would reap the result with your lifetime. A rather bum deal, if you ask me. This was a convenient way not to deal with those who suffered and was an easy way to judge an individual's family for their lack of faith. They caused their own problems by sitting in some way, so they're not my problem. So, who sinned? that this man was born with blindness. Jesus takes this question head on in Luke chapter 13, verses 2 through 3. Now apparently Pilate had massacred many Galileans. The crowds around Jesus want to know, was this because of the sin that they did or the sins of former generations? Jesus' answer, I tell you no. Another group of people had a tower collapse upon them. The same question came up, and Jesus answers, I tell you no. There are no glib answers as to the cause of our suffering. But Jesus' answer to suffering this time with a man born blind is this. It is not this man who sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God might be made known in him. What then does this mean? We can see in the progression of this story that as he is healed, God's works are indeed made known in his life. We first encounter him as a beggar who had likely sat in front of the temple gates for many years just begging day to day for his existence. When Jesus encounters this man, he calls himself the light of the world. Theologian Augustus Hare said, in darkness, there is no choice. And think about that. If you're a blind person, you're in darkness throughout most of your life. It is light that enables us to see the differences between things, and it is Christ who gives us this light. 
Jesus sees this man who was in both physical and spiritual darkness and helps him see in new ways with the light of heaven. So first, he places mud with spittle on his eyes. And then he tells him to be taken to the pool of Siloam to wash them. Because of his encounter with Jesus, his vision is no longer restricted. He begins to see the world in new ways, not just physically, but also spiritually. The flame of faith is born in his heart. Now those who had passed by him each day outside the temple gate saw him walking around being able to see and said, now wait a minute, isn't that the same beggar we've seen sitting in front of the temple day by day begging? Others looked right at him and saw him wearing the same clothes, having the same face, the same hair, the same voice, but their faith vision was restricted. No, it isn't him, but it sure looks like him. They were spiritually blind to God being at work in their world. But the man responded to them and said, It is me. Jesus did this for me. The neighbors wanted to know how such a thing could have happened, so they took him to those in charge, the keeper of the law, the Pharisees. As he stood there in the temple court, he said he didn't know about Jesus, but what he did know was this. I was blind, and now I see. The Pharisees checked their rule book under sinners and found the symptom. A man born blind. Then they looked under the laws of Sabbath and saw that this healing took place on Sabbath. So Jesus must have been a sinner too. But some Pharisees were puzzled. How can a sinner do what he just did? Apparently they were not impressed by the man's testimony and they decided that the whole thing was a lie. The neighbors who brought him in made it all up, perhaps trying to challenge their authority in some fashion. Yet isn't it interesting to consider that these leaders in the temple had probably passed by this formerly blind beggar every day on their way to the temple. They too had restricted vision. They were spiritually blind, unable to see God at work, and unable to truly see others in need. But they wanted to get to the bottom of this ruse, so they called the parents in. Whoops. There, where are the parents? There they are. <laughs> they asked them, okay, mom and dad, was he really blind from birth? And is this even your son? If so, how can he now see? The parents were afraid. They didn't want to cause trouble and then be kicked out of the temple, which meant their whole world would have been turned upside down. Yes, this is our son, and yes, he was born blind, but why he can see now we do not know, nor do we know who did this. They distanced themselves from the whole event, and at the end of their testimony, I do think there was just a little bit of a dig here when they said, he's old enough to answer for himself, why don't you go and ask him? So the man was brought back to the Pharisees for round two of the investigation. Now there is no more dissension in their wondering about Jesus. They said, we know this man is a sinner. God must have done this without this man, Jesus. So give God the praise. By now it's likely the healed beggar was getting tired of all this. I don't know about his personal struggles or his sins. I just know that once I was blind, but now I can see. His encounter with Jesus changed him. It healed him of his blindness, and a seed of faith was planted. Here in the second encounter with the Pharisees, it continued to grow. They asked the question once again, how did he do this? I already told you, and you didn't believe me. Why should I go through it all over again? Do you now want to become his disciples too? That unfortunately was a rather flippant remark to those in power, which made the Pharisees angry. You are one of his disciples. We are followers of Moses. We do not know this man or where he comes from. That reply angered the man, who in turn said, You don't know where he comes from? He has the power to heal me. God knows and loves those who are faithful. 
How could anyone do such a thing if he were a sinner? Things got more heated and name calling began. You, a sinner who were born in sin, would teach us those who are morally upright. And so he was thrown out of the temple, which means, in effect, he was excommunicated. Now, as the man sat outside the temple gates, Jesus showed up. He affirmed the faith of this follower who now believed him to be the Son of Man, that is, Messiah. Jesus then pronounced judgment. Who sinned? Jesus said it was the Pharisees, the ones whose vision was restricted, who remained blind to God's light shining in the world's darkened corners. They could not see. They could not believe God was at work in Jesus or in the man born blind, despite the evidence that was right in front of them. The Pharisees sought facts, but the blind man knew faith. I think the old saying, seeing is believing, needs a little bit of work. Seeing is believing means that we see something, so then we believe it. But I think that phrase should be turned around. It's not seeing is believing. It's believing is seeing. If you have the eyes of faith, if you see this world through the eyes of faith, You'll see things in a new way. You'll see God at work in your lives, God at work in this world, bringing hope where there is hopelessness, bringing change, bringing faith, bringing justice where there is oppression. It all depends on how you see things. But if you start by your belief, it'll help you see. And so, the question is, when you leave this place today, Will you see those who are oppressed and try and do something about it? Will you see those who are in need and try and help? Will you see those who are crushed in their spirit and try and lift them up? It all depends, sisters and brothers, on what's on your Christian faith license. Take a closer look. I did some things to it. May we go from this place today not having our vision be restricted, but being able to see with the eyes of faith so that we would believe and know that God is at work. God is at work in our lives, in our church, and in this world. Amen. Let us have silence as we consider God's word for us this day.